Hi, this is Dr. Dave, and this is a lecture on the Einstein summation rotation. The notes that I'm going to be writing on and explaining in this video should be uploaded with the YouTube video. If you do not see them for download there, you can check the course Moodle site. So today I'm going to be talking about Einstein summation notation, which is really a clever way um, to write out uh, vector mechanics and matrix mechanics and is seen a lot in topics such as quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, uh, general relativity, at least what's called the coordinate-based general relativity. Um, it is just a, a really nifty tool that can simplify yourself and save you, in the end, a lot of writing. So we're going to start out with, say, a vector. So what do I mean when a vector? You know, we often write a vector as something like this. So I have a vector A. It has three components, one, two, three, when working in three dimensions. There's nothing about this notation that stops it from working in more than three dimensions or even less than three dimensions. So, but today, everything we're doing is just three dimensions. So when I write, you know, A1, A2, A3, sometimes you might see it as AX, AY, AZ in the IJK direction, or sometimes even in introductory physics classrooms, we do X hat, Y hat, and Z hat, just trying to uh, reduce the total amount of new notation that you have to keep track of. I think probably the two most common ways you'll see a vector written is something like line one here or line two. But what does this line one mean and why does it look different? Well, technically this line one actually has an implied summation to it, at least if you want to write the vector out in terms of a particular vector space. So what does that mean? We'll look at this fourth line here. Here is vector A written out in terms of the A1, the first component in terms of E1, E2, and E3. And what E1, E2, and E3 are, are simply three orthonormal vectors um, in your particular vector space. So what does orthonormal mean? Orthonormal means that um, E1 and E2 are orthogonal, meaning that the dot product of them is zero or the angle between them is 90 degrees, you know, such as X dot Y is zero. So let's look at orthonormality conditions, right? You might have be familiar with I dot I or J dot J, K dot K is one. And then we know that I dot J, J dot K, I dot K is none. Um, you might also have seen this x dot x is 1, etc. The same thing works with e1, e2, and e3. They are simply three orthonormal vectors. So e1 dot e1 is 1, e1 dot e2 is 0, etc. There are no new things at this point. We're just simply writing these as e1, e2, e3 for reasons you'll see shortly. It actually simplifies our notation by adding in a new uh, letter. So now let's say we're to write down something like a sub i. Well, a sub i is just a number. We might call it a c number or a scalar. C number stands for commuting number. All that means is that it um, commutes multiplicatively with other things. So you've seen that before. Three, dot four, three times four is the same as four times three. In the same way, a dot i, or sorry, a i times b j is equal to b j times a i. These are just numbers. You can change the order that they're written. There is a vector a, but a sub i is simply a number of that vector. All right, so let's imagine you had a particular vector written as 3, 4, and 8. a2 would be 4, a3 would be 8, etc. There's really nothing, you know, happening here that, that's any different. Just for absolute clarity, um, you could also write this as 3, e1, plus 4, e2, hat, plus 8, E3 hat. Now, I want to stress that while I'm saying A2 or A3 or even AI is simply a number, E1 is not a number. That's actually a vector. So that's why we put the little hat on top to remind us. So I could write A, right, um, in this form here as a sum. So vector A is written as a sum of AI, EI, where if I just write that out explicitly, I get A1, E1, A2, E2, A3, E3, just like we had done here. Okay, so this is a, a bit of an overly verbose lecture, meaning that I'm going to say a lot more words than I need to, and even a lot more words than you might hear in a uh, typical lecture class, because I want to make sure that all of these words make sense and all these words land. And given this is a video that you can watch at your own convenience, feel free to back it up and, and watch it anytime. Okay, so let's get a little bit more into this. If I write A as a sum, as we just did, we get the following, which is A1, E1, A2, E2, A3, E3. No big deal. Um, now, we also know that I can change the order of these two things because a number times a vector is the same thing as a vector times a number. 
Well, when, uh, when can I not change the order of things? Well, imagine you were going to take the gradient of some scalar function here. Uh, we might say del f equals something. If you recall, right, f is just some function, it's not a vector, but del f creates a vector, and it does it as the following. You would take the partial derivative of the function f with respect to x in the x hat direction, then the partial derivative of the function with respect to your y variable in the y hat direction, and subsequently with z. Well, in this notation, what we're going to do is write it a little bit differently. We're going to write this now as e1, and then we're going to remove that sort of partial derivative from being kind of a fractionally looking thing to now just being del sub 1. And this is a pretty common notation. So del 1 equals d dot d, um, sorry, d1 equals d dot dx sub 1 or something like that. You'll see that notation more as you go on. And so now we write it as the following. That is, in this direction, we take that derivative and basically put it in that direction. This is a scalar which multiplies this vector to get the appropriate length. Same thing in the next case. The derivative with respect to the y-coordinate, or the second orthogonal direction, is assigned as a weight in front of the unit vector to tell you how far the vector should be. And then finally, the third one as well. Now, what is also true is you could write this as a sum. In the same way, you could simply say um, ei del i f. You could also, if you want to take this unit vector and put it inside of the derivative, why can you do that? Well, because unit vectors are constant, taking the derivative results in zero when you look at the product rule. So you could also write it as the following. This is pretty uncommon. It's really more common to see it looking like this. But there is one thing you can't do, because remember, this is not a number. This is an operation. It's a linear operator that says take a derivative in a particular direction. So what you can't do is you know, move this thing to the end. You always have to be very careful. So what we say is that del i f does not commute, so it's not f del i. And you'll see that language more coming uh, going forward, especially if you take quantum mechanics at K College. You'll see that. Okay, so let's get back to the main part of our lecture here. Let's now compute a dot product in this notation. Now I want to remind you that what I'm doing here is way more writing than one would ever need to do to do a dot product. But I'm doing it to show how much writing you could have when you take vector dot products, if you were to write out all the pieces without using any of the tricks that you know, to say, hey, let's use all the tricks you know and now these new ones to make your life simpler. So if you had a dot b, well, the first thing you'd have is a sub i, e sub i with this sum. And then we have another sum representing the b vector. Now here we change, we don't use i again, we use j instead. Why do we do that? Well, because we don't want any confusion, right? Let's imagine I had i's here and i's here. That's going to get really confusing when this sum is referring to this i and not that i. So we change letters to be j instead. So now, <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, technically, this is a sum of three terms as so. And this is a sum of three terms as so. So as you write it out, all of a sudden it's starting to look really messy. We have Three terms here dotted into three more terms here. That's going to give us nine terms just by distributive property of algebra that you would have done, you know, back in 10th grade. But we're going to write it out um, today just because I want to be really clear what this notation is doing. So if I take A1, E1, and I simply multiply, I dot that into this whole product, this is what I get. I get this A1 in front of all these terms. I get E1 dotted into E1, that's here. I get E1 dotted into E2, which is here. And I get E1 dotted into E3, which is here. And so what I get now is three terms from this term and these terms. Following the same pattern from here to here, I now get uh, three more terms. And then finally, from here into here, I get three more terms for a grand total of nine terms. So it's nine terms, it's a lot, but let's let's look at what we know. First off, we said that these were orthonormal. Ortho meaning orthogonal. So this E1 dot E1, that's going to be one. E1 dot E2, that's going to be none. E1 dot three is none. So let's now look at that. So what we get was, well, technically we had nine terms. After we, you know, computed the pieces that we knew, we only ended up getting three terms. And this particular structure isn't an accident, as we'll see in just a moment. 
And if you then drop all the zeros and add them up, you get A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3, which is the familiar result for a dot product. It's what you would have done had you not known anything else, which we can then put into a sum notation, which I recognize makes a lot of students feel a little bit uncomfortable with the summations and integrals, etc. But you're physics students, and I trust that you'll be brave, and you're just going to do it. All right, so let's now go back and summarize some of these results and see what we've learned. As we said, our uh, unit vectors e1, e2, e3 are orthogonal, so e1 dot e1, e2 dot e2, etc. is 1. The ones that are dotted with things that are not themselves is 0. And so if we look at ei dot ej, first thing we notice is that it's going to be symmetric with respect to ej dot ei. What does symmetric mean? It means that as I change um, uh, i and j, I don't change my sign. I get the same sign that I would have gotten before. What does that mean? Well, let's just look here. If I did e1.e1, uh, e1, right? If I swap that order, that's e1.e1. E1. Yeah, I know it looks the same. It's kind of a point. How can you tell? The point is, is you're still going to get 1, not a minus 1. And if you were to swap the order of these two in a dot product, you would still get zero, right? Because negative zero is still zero. This actually comes up so much that we have a new notation for it. That is called the Kronecker delta. Now, the Kronecker delta um, is given here. It says delta ij. And when i and j equal one another, this thing equals one in the same way that e1 dot e1 is one. And when i doesn't equal j, you get none in the same way that we had here, e2 dot e3 is 0. So then what we can say is that ei dot ej is the same thing as delta ij, and as we already knew here, this was no longer a vector, and this thing is no longer a vector. This is not even a vector component. It's still just a number, but it's not even a vector anymore. It's now going to be something different. We'll see in a moment it's going to be a matrix. All right. But why would I write all this out? Why would I write when I could have, from the beginning of ai dot b, gone all the way to that step right there, why did I do all of these pieces here? Hopefully that will become clear on the next page. The, the take-home point is we're going to be using uh, a new notation with summations. That's going to look really kind of frightening. But I want you to be able to keep track of what all the pieces are actually doing. What they're actually saying to do is to write out all these terms. We're never going to write all this stuff out, but we're going to use a summation notation that's going to basically be doing all of this stuff in the background, helping us get to the right answer. All right, so let's return to the dot product and <clears throat> sort of proceed to the end in a bit of a faster way. So the first thing I want to remind you are there are a couple of rules to doing science that we never really tell you. They're kind of unspoken rules. So the first rule is you find the answer to a problem no matter what, right? Sounds easy, right? Well, that's what you often do in your homework problems. Um, and that's where many of you stop. And that's why you find physics to be hard, is because you stop after you found the answer. The next step to doing physics or science, et cetera, is why was the problem obvious, right? Why was that the thing you should have done? What, what you know, why should the problem have taken you five minutes, not three hours? That's the, the really important reflection step that all of you need to be doing. And then in our textbooks and then when we're teaching courses, we act like it always was obvious. So I don't really need you to do that third step, but I do want you to figure out why these things should have been obvious. So let's go back to the dot product now that we figured out what it is in terms of writing out sums. And let's see why it was an easy thing to do. So. We start with a dot b, which we write as our familiar sums that we did above, which we then combine our sums as the following. That is, we, we put both sums out in front. Now, if you remember from Calc 2, it's always okay to change the orders of infinite sums. This is an infinite sum that when you do the j sum, that will give you three terms. When you then do three more sums of three more terms, you get nine terms. You're going to get all right here doing those sums. You're going to get this thing. But you no longer have to write that all out. You can leave it in a summation form. So 
<coughs> we know from the dot product here of ei dot ej that that's going to give us the chronic delta. So that right there is going to cut down a lot of that work that we'd already been doing. So now we have to ask ourselves, what happens in this sum here? Well, I'm summing over bj delta ij. But this is only going to contribute, meaning you're only going to get a non-zero term in your multiplication of your summation. When what? When i is equal to j. So then what happens is when we do our j sum, this j uh, sum happens, only happens when j equals i. So that effectively replaces this j with an i subscript. And we just sort of summarize that, and from now on until the end of time, you may always do this. When you see something like CM uh, delta MN, and you do the M sum, that changes this M to an N. Because the only time you got something in writing out the particular sum was when, when M was equal to N. All right, so this is probably one of the best tools you're going to use in this summation notation is using the chronico delta function to replace one index with another index. All right, <clears throat> so now, what is the Einstein summation notation? It's not exactly what we've been doing here, but it is using what we've been doing here. Einstein noticed in all of his vector work that any time he had indices that were repeated, for example, i and i, or j and j, that there was a sum out front. And so, you know, trying to be more efficient with notation, he said, Anytime you have a repeated index, there's a sum. So instead of writing this sum, we just drop it. So vector A means <coughs> AI, EI, which means a sum of those three things. Vector B, right, means the same thing. So now when I do A dot B, we can just skip to this step right here. A dot B is the following, which means a1, b1, a2, b2, a3, b3. And we drop that sum out front. You'll actually see um, in advanced physics texts, occasionally you'll see something like f sub i, um, uh, 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 b sub i, and then in parentheses it will say no sum. Because this appears in so many different places, everyone assumes in higher level physics, anytime you have two indices that are the same, there is a sum someplace. Well, now, we don't use it anymore. Okay. So <coughs> um, let's go on. We're going to see the chronic delta a lot. The chronic delta means um, this is a, a, it's just a number. It's not a sum. It's just a single solitary number because that i is not the same as that j. So a couple of questions, and I hope that you pause the video and ponder this for a moment. What would delta i i mean? What, what would it evaluate to? And um, I'm going to ask you a few more problems um, involving this notation on your, your next homework. Look for those uh, probably today or tomorrow. Um, but what is this operation? What is that mathematical operation? What does it mean? And the answers will be at the end of this, maybe at the end of the homework. I'm not entirely certain. Um, we'll see how long the video takes. All right. So then what does something like AIJ mean? Well, AI meant a vector because you only need one index to represent that vector. AIJ would instead represent a matrix. What do I mean by that? Well, if I had matrix A, I could write it as the following, right? Nine separate components. Whereas that I would refer to this one and that J would refer to that J. If you don't remember, I is always, so the first index is always the row index and the second index is always the column index. So, Aij is the i row and j -th column, for example, a23, a12, and then 3123. Oops. <laughs> a23. Okay. So, what is the matrix form then of delta ij? Well, remember, we only get one when i equals j. And that's going to happen here on these right there. It doesn't happen in the off diagonals, those are all zero. So the matrix form of delta really is just the identity 